the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And with your spirit. Today we celebrate the feast day of priests who had a great devotion to the two hearts of Jesus and Mary, St. John and Jesus. So if you know this beautiful devotion and the, the consecration of one's home to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, St. John Hughes is the one who is one of those that really develops that theology of going to these two hearts and learning how to love the two hearts and allow the Immaculate Heart of Mary to, 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 to come more and more within our own heart and the Sacred Heart of Jesus that they might be able to find rest and home. Um, St. John Hughes also has this very beautiful, um, he was called at a, at a particular time um, in which there was a heresy called Jansenism, in which it denied the, the mercy of God and, and focused on a justice, but a justice that was more of a, a tyranny or um, sort of this very vengeful, wrathful God. And there was even um, moments in which even cathedrals in France, they would um, have these images. So there was at least one of them that had this image painted of Jesus, but it was not a Jesus that was saying, come to my heart, but it was like this Jesus like this, ready to just beat you up. And it was kind of the experience, they put it right in front of the tabernacle, as if to say, don't even think of coming near me. And so we can think about the first reading today, about the, the shepherds who are leading uh, the people astray. And this was one of those moments in which um, people were saying, I, I can't come to the Lord um, because the Lord loves, but he doesn't really love me, or he, you know, I'm, 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 uh, I'm someone who I have to get perfect in order to come to the Lord. And so the sacred heart of Jesus' devotion, and even here the devotion of the two hearts, was when Jesus came and said, I need to show them my heart. I need to show them that you can trust me. And the thing that hurts the heart of Jesus more than anything else is when we distrust him distrust that he actually can be that merciful to us. Brethren, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. You are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who wonderfully chose the priest, St. John Hughes, to proclaim the infallible riches of Christ, grant us by his example and teachings that, growing in knowledge of you, we may live faithfully by the light of the gospel our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophecy against the shepherds of Israel. In these words, prophecy to them, to the shepherds. Thus says the Lord God, Woe to the shepherds of Israel, who have been pasturing themselves. Should not shepherds, rather, pasture sheep? You have fed off their milk, worn their wool, and slaughtered their fatling. But the sheep you have not pastured, you did not strengthen the weak, nor heal the sick, nor bind up the injured. You did not bring back the stray, nor seek the lost, but you lorded it over them, harshly and brutally. So they were scattered for the lack of a shepherd, and became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered, and wandered over all the mountains and high hills. My sheep were scattered over the whole earth, with no one to look after them, or to search for them. Therefore, shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As 
I live, says the Lord God, because my sheep have been given over to pillage, and because my sheep have become food for every wild beast, for lack of a shepherd, because my shepherds did not look after my sheep, but pastured themselves and did not pasture my sheep, because of this, shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, I, am swear, I swear I am coming against these shepherds. I will claim my sheep from them. I will put a stop to their shepherding my sheep, so that they may no longer pasture themselves. I will save my sheep, that they may no longer be food for their mouths. For thus says the Lord God, I myself will look after and tend my sheep. The word of the Lord. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In birth pastures he gives me repose. Beside restful waters he leads me. He refreshes my soul. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. He guides me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk in the dark valley, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. With your rod and your staff that give me courage. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. You spread the table before me, in the sight of my foes. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Only goodness and kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. able to discern the reflections and thoughts of the heart. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with them for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. Going out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You two go into my vineyard, and I will give you what is just. So they went off. And he went out again around noon and around three o'clock and did likewise. Going out about five o'clock, he found others standing around and said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They answered, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You too go into my vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Summon the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those who had started about five o'clock came, each received the usual daily wage. So when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also got the usual daily wage. And on receiving it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last ones worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who bore the day's burden and the heat. He said to one of them in reply, My friend, I am not cheating you. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? 
take what is yours and go. What if I wish to give this last one the same as you? Or am I not free to do as I wish with my own money? Are you envious? Because I am generous. Thus, the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Yesterday we talked about maybe some of the blind spots in our, our own culture's sensibilities. Remember that sort of funny thing even within our national culture? Sometimes we can look at ourselves as the very center of the world in our sports and in our media and everything. We forget that there's others who are outside of us. Well, isn't this another one that probably for our culture maybe more than others, it maybe kind of rails against. There seems to be something not fair here. You have these guys that only work one hour. They get the exact same amount of money as those that worked from the beginning of the day and worked and slave and burdened, and then people just kind of show up and they kind of do a little bit get exactly the same. But think about that. If, if you had co-workers, or, you know, you were one of those that are working at the very, very beginning, and someone just kind of slips in, does a little bit, and they get exactly the same paycheck. Doesn't this kind of, like, go against our American sensibilities of, of fairness, of, like, they need to get one-tenth of what we did because we worked hard, therefore, we get more. And yet, what God is saying here is he doesn't work that way. He has this line, he says, are you envious because I'm so generous? It's something for us to think about, especially, especially those of us, you know, you guys are daily mass goers. In many ways, you guys could be considered those who are working the whole day, bearing the, the, the brunt of the day's work. This is maybe directed towards us, who are maybe, we could say, professional Catholics. Imagine getting to heaven, and the person who greets you is someone who was like a notorious criminal. Or just think of that politician in your mind that you can't stand. And they're the one greeting you at the pearly gates. What would you do? Would you be like, wait a minute, why are you here greeting me? You should be in the other place. What if it was Osama bin Laden? who is at the pearly gates, greeting you. I mean, this is where the rubber hits the road. We want to have the heart of God, who wants all of his children in heaven. Are we willing to pray that everyone, even those that we despise, or those who have done great evil and great wrong, and remember, sin leads to condemnation, but the, the, the lesson of this parable is that God can save someone even in the final hour. God can save anyone if they're open to his mercy. He never forces them to come to heaven. And our sin solidifies a statement against God unless we turn to him in time. But if we turn, God is always there to catch us, to scoop us up, and to bring us to heaven. That's his deepest desire. And if right now, if we start thinking about if there's someone in our life that if we saw them greeting us at the pearly gates, and we are resisting that, well, maybe there's something there in which we don't understand the deep mercy of God. 
here's something to think about with this as well. Think about those who were waiting and maybe only worked one hour. And so if we look at it from one point of view, we could say they didn't do enough, um, they shouldn't get enough money. But maybe that master, that owner, is maybe looking at it in a different way. I don't know if anyone's ever had that experience of being unemployed or just waiting on the side. I remember in D.C. Um, when I would drive by, there were many people that were trying to get work. A lot of times there was an undocumented status or so, and they're trying to provide for their families. And you just see them all waiting at the corner for someone to come and to give them work for that day. And sometimes they were there the whole day, and sometimes they never got anything. Imagine what that feels like. Maybe for some of us who've never had that experience, we don't really know that experience of humiliation, the experience of rejection, the experience of, I can't take care of my children. And that's a suffering. And maybe this laborer or this, this um, owner maybe saw that in a certain sense, they went through such a terrible suffering, more than those who had a job and who were working and who were getting paid and doing the, that work right there. These over here, they were suffering from their humiliation and their lack of dignity. And so quite possibly, what the landowner is doing here is saying, I want to make up for the way in which society didn't lift you up in your dignity, didn't take care of you and sort of pushed you off to the side. That's the God of mercy. And the way that divine mercy works, and one of my friends, Vinnie Flynn, wrote some really beautiful books um, called The Seven Secrets of Divine Mercy or the Confession of the Eucharist. One of the things that he points out is he says, God loves us backwards in the way that we would normally think if there's someone who is hurting me, I should love them less. If there's someone that's walking away from me versus someone who's coming to me, I should love them less. But the way that God's mercy works is that his misery, or our misery, is a magnet to his mercy. And there is this mysterious way in the message of divine mercy that God actually loves us more in the midst of our sinfulness. Because he knows that he need that we need it more. It's like a child that you have. Maybe you have a child in your family who has, you know, is is someone who has given you a lot of hardship. Maybe in their teenage years or so, the real rebellious child. And in many ways, they cause you more pain than anyone else. And yet, isn't there a way in which your mother heart, your father heart, that loves them more? Not in a way that's unfair, but this way in which you know that they need this care because they're struggling, they're wilting, they're, they're going astray, and there's something in your heart that makes you want to run to them even more. Not that you don't love your other children less, but there's something about that, that one child who just struggles and hurts and, and hurts you that you're like, you hurt me, but I love you more. That's the God of mercy. And so we need to have that kind of heart as well. That when we see someone hurting or a sinner, one, we should recognize that we're sinners in need of God's mercy. But there should be something that happens in our heart that actually runs to that person all the more. Instead of pushing them away and saying, you get what you owe or what, what's owed to you, you only get one-tenth what God wants to give you because you're a sinner. Instead, we should say, God's never going to give up on anyone. And this person right here that's, that's falling away, that's hurting, God wants to run to them even more. And that can also help us, too. Because maybe there's sometimes, and this is what St. John Hughes 
preached against was this heresy of Jansenism that said, God loves you to the extent that you are perfect, that you have everything together, then he loves you. Then he'll say, come, you can come and, and sit over here. But if there's anything wrong with you, if you're still struggling, if you're still following, Jansenism, Jansenism would say, um, stay away from me until you figure out how to get your act together, and then I'll have mercy on you. Do you see how it's kind of reversed? Instead of God running to us like he does in the cross, in the incarnation, where he just plows into our misery in order to lift us up, Jansenism, and this is something that we can fall into, is a sense of, I have to figure out how to get better myself in order for God to accept me. And if I'm not ready, then God won't love me, he won't accept me, and he'll say, well, come back later when you figure out how to deal with it. That's not God. God is the God here who sees even those who have been waiting and maybe that have not been getting everything together. They don't have their job in a sense. They're not, you know, sort of working through that. They're, they're just kind of drifting. They're sort of floating there. And the Lord is actually going to pour an increase of mercy on them. Because that's the way that he works. So this should give us great hope, but it also should challenge us to have the heart of God especially to those that maybe are struggling or away from their faith, have the heart of God towards them. And in doing that, you become a magnet, as their misery is a magnet in which you start living out the message of divine mercy. That mercy becomes a magnet for them to say, wow, I am loved by so great a God who didn't give up on me even when I might have given up on him. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness. 
Jesus, we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Through the vine, the work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Most merciful God, who are pleased to create and blessed St. John Eutes, the new man in your image, the old having passed away, graciously grant that, renewed like him, we may offer you the sacrifice, the acceptable sacrifice of conciliation through Christ our Lord. supper was ended. He took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of a new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Lord, your church. 
church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis R. Pope, Richard R. Administrator, Ronald R. Bishop Elect, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and hear you hear, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. On yesterday, we told his heart would be miserable and no On yesterday, we told his heart would be miserable and no On yesterday, we told his heart
power of the sacrament, Lord, we pray. Lead us always in your love. Through the example of Blessed St. John Hughes, and bring to fulfillment the good work you have begun in us until the day of Christ Jesus, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Toward the final blessing, I want to share it's both happy news and sad news from different points of view. Um, we're getting ready to, to reopen our school right now, and um, we're figuring out a way of school kids um, every single week. Um, this is really important because especially during this time we might have been disconnected from receiving the Eucharist and so it's important for us to keep growing in that. The, the sadness with that is that in order for us to do that we can have half of the school come to a mass but in doing that because of the policies of schools during this time um, the school kids teachers aren't able to mix with the general populace so we're kind of wrestling back and forth but um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays um, at least at this point right now I think starting with uh, August 27th um, we're gonna have those be school masses but the sad part is I wouldn't be able to do a daily mass for it'll be at the same time um, but the daily mass would need to be People wanted to go to St. Pat's at that time, St. Paul's or St. John's, or be able to, to watch it over over you know virtual right now. Um, you know, and I know this is this is a hardship for especially a lot of you that you know every day of being able to come. But the wrestling that I had to go through is if I only had one school mass, then the kids would go every other week, versus if I do half and half then those little parishioners of, of this uh, and that ministry, they'll be able to be fed with the bread of God every single week during the school day. And it becomes actually a point of communion for them because this is going to be a very difficult year for schools everywhere um, in which there won't be as many sort of community gathering moments. A lot of their work will be in their classrooms, and so the Mass will actually be a place in which they can really feel a little normal. Um, and so it was really just kind of weighing on my heart to, you know, to, to do this decision right now. So, you know, I'm sorry if, you know, in any way this, this hurts, kind of stings, but um, in the midst of this time of flexibility and sacrifice to um, be able to just offer this especially for the children will have the opportunity of being able to, to grow in their faith during this difficult time and so pulls against them in so many different ways. So um, I'll speak more about that. If you have more questions or you know thoughts, you can always reach out to me. Um, but that's something that I wanted to let you know as soon as possible. Um, so next week is when school begins. So that Thursday, those Tuesdays and Thursdays will be ones that We'll start at 8.05, um, but it'll just be for the school. And then Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we'll have our regular daily mass here as well, okay? So pray uh, pray for pray for the children as well, just that this be a time for them to discover in the midst of trial just a beautiful hunger for the Eucharist. That's kind of one of the themes I'm going to be working with them, is like really just going deep with the Lord and the Eucharist um, so that they just create these roots deep. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke it with humbly pray. And do thou, Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the divine power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. And now for our school and for all schools, we pray. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession, was 
love you unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly to you, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To you do I come, before you I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer me. 